So welcome to the second part of the course on mobile sensing and robotics here taught at the University of Bonn in Germany. And I want to introduce this course and give you within a few minutes an idea what you can expect from this term. So this is a course which is taught together with Lasse Klingbeil and Hannah Kuhlmann. I will take care of the robotics part and Lasse Klingbeil will take care of the mobile sensing part. So we are looking here especially into mobile robot systems that move through the environment, want to perceive the environment, build models of the environment. So the state estimation task related to estimating what the world looks like and where a platform is in the world will play a central role here in that course. So what are robots or intelligent systems? Um, we are referring here in this course to mobile systems. That means systems that can move through the environment. So this can be systems which drive through the environment with wheels, with track-based systems, so they can actuate their motors in order to move through the environment, and they are equipped with sensors in order to perceive the environment. And the same holds for drones or also autonomous cars. These are also systems which can control their steering, they can control their velocities in order to move through the environment, and they have sensors. These can be cameras on board of the drone or uh, lay the range scanners, cameras, radars, and other sensors on more sophisticated vehicles such as autonomous cars. And there's a wide range of different robotic systems. In this course here, we will try to step back a bit and leave the kind of control or action part out of the game. And we are looking here only into the perception problems, and especially the perception problems related to geometry, so geometric reconstruction. We will not look into semantic estimation, for example. Um, at least it won't be a real focus of that course. So we look into the question, how can we estimate what the environment looks like and where we are as a robot in the environment? Looking into sensor data, mainly focusing on two sensing modalities. And first, this will be laser range data, so range data, and the second thing will be camera data. So you will get some hands-on experience with um, 3D LiDAR data as well as with camera data. But we are not taking explicitly into account that uh, systems, for example, a car or a small-scale robot or a drone will just take the sensor stream as input and except of a few exceptions, we are not taking into account what kind of system actually um, drove through the environment in order to acquire that sensor data. And with this, focusing on state estimation problems, we are in the core of a lot of robotics tasks. So there are two fundamental questions in mobile robotics, if you see it like this. The first one is, what's the state of the world? And the world itself um, is the environment of the platform, it's the state of the platform itself, and all the relevant parameters. And the second key question is, which action to execute or to select? And this depends on what the goal of that autonomous system. Um, and it's also clear that those functions are coupled with each other. Because in order to know what to do, I need to know in which state I am or what the world looks like. And given an action that I'm executing, I may impact the state of the world. So it's a state estimation and action selection problem. And these are coupled problems. I can't treat state estimation completely without action selection. I mean, I can, but then I'm ignoring some aspects of the problem. And even more extreme, I can't really do action selection if I don't know what the environment looks like. So perception is still a bit more independent from the action side than the other way around. Uh, so I can do perception without knowing how the system um, moves through the environment or what the system did, although it helps me that I have that information. But doing action selection without knowing what the world looks like um, is more suboptimal, let's say that way. At least it's harder to generate a specific behavior. Um, as I said before, so this part down here, we will not really cover in that course here. We will mainly look at the state estimation problem. In some parts of um, the state estimation problems, of course, we assume to know the control commands that we have executed, but we are not taking into account that we can actually control the platform and select, for example, motion commands or sets motion commands to the platform in order to optimize our belief about uh, the world, for example. So this active perception, for example, is not part of that course. So we are mainly focusing here on that state estimation problem. And again, in the context of state estimation, there are a couple of different tasks which are relevant. What does the world look like? What's around me? Uh, what am I seeing? <clears throat> and we are focusing here 
on the geometric parts of that. So estimating 3D geometry about what the environment looks like. What we are not doing is, for example, semantic estimation or scene interpretation. So we're not trying to estimate, okay, the thing that I'm seeing here is actually a human or a building. Uh, we are agnostic to that and we are only working on the geometric information that we have. We can do better if we have semantic uh, information. We may exploit it at one part or the other, saying, okay, this is a human, this is probably um, an element or elements of my range scan that I don't want to take into account for point cloud registration, for example. That's something that we may do, but um, the semantic estimation is not a core part of that, of that course here. So we are focusing on the geometry, and even if we want to reduce this further, main focus will be on what does the world looks like, looks like and where is the robot in that world. So location estimation of the platform and mapping of the environment. These are kind of two core parts that I'm going to cover here in this course. And this is also similar for the mobile sensing part that Lasse Klingbal um, is teaching, where he also looks a lot into um, mobile sensing aspects for monitoring purposes where action selection plays a minor role or no role at all and also the semantic information is not really in the focus. So again it's one part the robotics part which I'm teaching and the other part here is separated from this. So let's dive a little bit deeper and, and have a look what you're going to learn in this course. So we will be looking into a, a set of problems from in the context of the simultaneous localization and mapping problem with laser data and then looking into the use of cameras. And we are starting out with a very short introduction into the least squares approach. So um, this is a core technique that is used, for example, in the context of graph-based SLAM for solving the simultaneous localization and mapping problem using a graph-based representation of the environment. And it's a key tool that we are using very frequently here in this course. Um, then we will look into point cloud registration here starting from known data association generalizing this to unknown data association and again then least squares problems. So this is something which is also known as the ICP algorithm or iterative closest point and really try to derive it really from the basics so that you get an idea how point cloud registration actually works. Then we will use this as a building block and can use this inside a SLAM system. We'll look here into graph based SLAM starting with post graphs. So this is a representation where the location of the platform, the pose of the system um, is estimated at different points in time. Attached to this pose information is local map information which is registered with each other and therefore we will use the ICP algorithm or other techniques for point cloud registration that lets us build a graph of soft constraints that we are then aim at optimizing using uh, the squares approach and this way can estimate where the platform is in the world and what does the world actually looks like. We will look here into different techniques, how to optimize this, for example, hierarchical approaches. We will also look into landmark-based approaches, which is then tightly coupled to um, bundle adjustment, for example, if um, you think in terms of cameras. So we will be doing this here in terms of laser data and then look into cameras a little bit later. Also look into robust estimation, basically the question, how do we deal with outliers with um, wrong data associations in our sensor data. Then we will move over to cameras and the question is how do cameras work? Um, what kind of information can we extract from a camera? This will lead to different uh, key point extractors and um, feature descriptions such as whatever SIFT or ORB or similar representations or simplifications of the image content into features. And those features will basically be used as points that we observe in the environment and then can do reconstruction tasks based on this. So we will look into camera models. How are those points from the 3 world mapped onto the um, camera image? Um, that's important if you want to interpret the camera image and then generate 3D reconstructions from this. Um, we will look into relative orientation problems. So where is one camera with respect to a second camera or a camera at um, time one with respect to two time two just based on this image information. This will lead to the relative orientation, the stereo pair, um, the essential matrix, fundamental matrix, um, and then the eight-point algorithm, so a technique to estimate where is camera two with respect to camera one just based on image correspondences. And these corresponding points stem from those feature extractors that we have discussed before.
We will also look a little bit into camera calibration in, in basic form. Um, so looking into the DLT, the direct linear transform, which estimates the basic um, intrinsics and the extrinsics of a camera, and then also into more sophisticated method, for example, um, that we can use in order to estimate our camera parameters on nonlinear distortions. Tsang's method, for example, is something that we will look into. So this gives you an idea of what we are doing from a technical perspective. So everything is related to a geometry estimation based on LiDAR data or camera data. And we will start at the first thing with point cloud registration. So this is an example of point cloud. So this is the existing point cloud. The blue point cloud here is the current scan and how we can register a local point cloud with the next point cloud and then turn this into a map representation or into a globally light point cloud. This is one of the underground mapping examples here of um, Andreas Nüchter that I'm showing. Um, so there's a platform which takes local 3D scans and then registers them one after the other. We take that a step further and take, for example, a 3D LiDAR scanner mounted on a vehicle, on a car. We can register all those scans incrementally, um, 10 times per second, um, build a, globally, a point cloud, a global point cloud, and then also need this kind of a slam ideas in there. So it's a postgraph-based slam system which sits behind it and performs optimizations trying to find the best possible global configuration of the different sensor positions and the map of the environment in order to come up with a good representation so that the system is able to close loops um, and perform a robust optimization um, and come up with a map in the end. In this case, it's a surface-based map, so a 3D map which consists of uh, three surface elements, not just pixels, but surface elements for the alignment um, so that you can actually will learn how those systems work and how you can build at least a basic SLAM system with it. So whenever you do point cloud registration or solve the simultaneous localization mapping problem, you will be dealing with outlier points, so with data associations that are wrong or incorrect, and these those need to be taken into account. And this is something that we also will briefly look into robust optimization, but from a, not from a very theoretical perspective, but more from a practical perspective. So there are different residual distributions, which are shown here um, in this histogram. This is basically how your error distribution looks like. And the question is then, which kind of robust kernels, for example, you want to use? Do you need a robust kernel at all? Uh, how strongly do you want to downweight certain outliers? And there are adaptive techniques that we will um, look into in order to adjust those, um, uh, those kernel functions or robust estimators um, in order to come up with a system which is robust to sensor noise and outliers in the data association. We'll then move a bit further and look into camera images. And um, we start with a single camera and then looking to stereo camera. So this is, for example, a camera here in the stereo normal case. So both cameras looking forward into the same direction that are only shifted um, in one direction along that axis, one with respect to the other. What can we say about um, the sensor or the points that we extract and can triangulate? So we may get different uncertainties. Uh, so some points which are nearby, we can estimate with a higher precision rather than points which are further away. And this is also something that we will look into in how to actually estimate based on coin point correspondences where camera one is with respect to camera two. So they can track the movement of a camera through the environment and theoretically it can then use this information in order to build 3D models of the environment based on multiple camera image, images. And that's at least the idea on what you should learn in this course. So get the foundations for solving simultaneous localization and mapping problems dealing with laser range scanners as well as with cameras. So this is roughly the topics of this course that you will be experiencing here in this term and that are also available all as video lectures here. In addition to the traditional lectures, um, I used these five-minute summaries from the series Five Minutes with Cyril that I started um, a bit more than a year back, uh, trying to explain key topics um, or concepts within five minutes. Um, so they are parts of that course. Um, so this gives you a brief summary or brief um, preparation for uh, diving deeper with the lecture material. And so in the playlist that you find for this course, there are a lot of kind of short five minute summaries of certain concepts also in there. But you only don't only need to 
take those courses into account. Um, you also have to do homework assignments in order to pass this course, at least for the students here at the University of Bonn. Um, so in order to be admitted to the exam, you need to solve at least 50% of the homework assignments, although I encourage you to do 100%, so do everything, but minimum is 50% of the uh, point that you can gain, you have to gain in order to be admitted to the exam. The homework assignments involve a lot of um, coding. Um, this is typically done in Python. Um, so we have changed the homework assignments a little bit from the previous year. So there are uh, more homework assignments, but in slightly smaller ones, looking into the different topics that you will be experiencing here in this course. You can do your homework assignments in teams of two. So you can team up with a maximum one other partner, so two students max. Um, you can also do it on your own and um, send in your homework assignments, solve the task together, but make sure everyone of the group knows the whole project. So it's not the idea that you split your homework assignments into two parts, student one does the first part and student two does the second part. No, the intention is that you do that together. You're allowed to do this as a team of two, but everyone is responsible for knowing their homework assignments and also being able to present those homework assignments. Submissions and the assignments will be given out via um, the eCampus system here at the university, so we can actually track when uh, things have been, projects have been submitted. And again, limit your collaboration to your team members. Um, don't copy other person's result or results from um, previous years or other homework assignments. So there's a zero tolerance on plagiarism. If we caught you on plagiarism, you will not get exam admission and you're out of that course and you even can't take the second exam, so you have to wait a complete year. You will use a, lose a complete year in your studies. Um, therefore, I strongly disencourage you um, to go towards copying your homework assignments from someone else. So we are pretty relaxed on a lot of things, but the plagiarism part, um, we are rather strict on that here in this course. Um, important thing is the homework assignments have a deadline. You have to submit them by the deadline. Um, if the whole course um, is busy with maybe other duties, you can talk to us before and we can see if we do a global shift of the deadline, but this shouldn't happen uh, the evening before the deadline just because you and your partner don't manage to submit your homework assignments. Um, so if there are serious issues with certain deadlines, let us know early enough and we take care of it, but otherwise the deadline is a deadline and you should stick with it. Um, the course consists of lectures, which are given here as video recordings. We will have tutorials for the students enrolled in this course here at the University of Bonn. This will be done via Zoom or in person. This depends a little bit on the current situation. Um, there you can ask questions. You can either talk to me or to one of our uh, teaching assistants, which are happy to help you out, answer your questions and explain you things, for example, you haven't understood in your homework assignments. Then there are the homework assignments, again, a key part important for the exam admissions and please stick to the deadlines. And at the end of the course, at the end of the term, there will be an oral exam where we will be examining you, asking you the concepts in this course. You will need to be able to explain things, explain things to us, maybe do some basic derivations so that we can make sure you understood the concepts, can explain them and not just kind of whatever, learned a few equations and can repeat those equations. That wouldn't be sufficient. Um, again, homework assignments play an important role in my courses here um, because they both give you the hands-on experience actually implementing the things on your own, which for me is a key building block to understanding what I actually teach. So you can always listen to a video and think, okay, I think I got it. But once you're sitting down and either explain it yourself or implement it yourself, you will truly see if you understood the concepts and therefore take those homework assignments seriously. They are a really good tool for understanding the concepts here and therefore those homework assignments are also important for me. Okay, with this I'm coming to the end with the um, intro here. So uh, if you have any questions, contact me or contact the uh, teaching assistants which are available here to help you during your studies, um, at least for the students enrolled at the University uh, of Bonn, we provide that service. If anything is unclear, please contact us. You can ask us questions um, and if through eCampus, you will see the possible means to contact us, um, to engage with us uh, differently than email or um, talk to us on Zoom, for example. All these things are possible. If something is unclear and you're uncertain, it's totally fine to ask. With this, 
Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you will all successfully pass the exam at the end of the course. Thank you very much.